he's messed it up now. Hello? Right. Well, how, how are you doing, everybody? Are you sure? You've been listening to Andres Segovia, the greatest, cello, the greatest guitarist I think who's ever lived, playing the memories of Alhambra as a very, very young man, very young. And we've changed from the majestic, um, yeah, we, we are no longer listening to We've been listening to Segovia, and we were listening to John Hall's trumpet. And so today we're going to do Manet, the Dejeuner Suleb. Right. Anything else? <laughs> Thanks. I chose the guitar in, in memory of Victorine, who comes into the story a bit later on. And uh, that's why I changed it. So we're going to first look at Manet. Manet just, I think, is probably the greatest painter of, of the 19th century. And he's born on the 23rd of January, 1832, and today is his birthday. So quite wonderfully, we've coincided this tribute to the great man on his birthday. So yes, he's born in Paris. Um, we are now in the age of photography, so we can see what he looked like. Very high forehead, immensely intelligent, great style, great charm, good manners. The only one of the group of so-called impressionists who fitted that bill. And he never considered himself an impressionist. He really was the last of the old masters and the first of the new. Um, this is a photo by Felix Nader, who was a very swashbuckling photographer. He had a terrific studio in Paris, which he painted bright red. And during the Commune, he hot, hot air ballooned in and out of Paris, taking the post. So Felix Nader very helpfully recorded all the artists of this period, and we have photographs. Um, Manet's mother was very cultivated. She had a musical background. She came from good family. And he, um, he wore a gray suit and he wore a top hat. And when he appeared at the Café Gerboise, where the young new painters met, some of them felt that they couldn't shake his hand. One, one who felt like that was Cezanne, who was rough and ready from the south and had a really atrocious accent. Now, Manet then was the last of the old masters. And he shows himself here in a portrait, which is quite heartbreaking, because he's very young. Um, he's only about 48 or so. And he is really very ill by this time. It's a self-portrait painted in 1878. And it sold for nearly $30 million in 2010. He portrays himself in a typical three-quarter attitude um, with light on one side of the face, defines himself as a painter by including his brushes and his palette, and he is referencing the great self-portraits of Rembrandt. So towards the end of his life, he defines himself as an absolutely authentic mainstream, as it were, old master painter. I think that's quite interesting. This is not painted in an Impressionist style. But you know that when I say he was the last of the old masters, Manet could paint the most amazingly powerful paintings. Just to show you one, um, this is from 1865-64. It's a head of Christ here. And for you to perhaps think about Anthony van Dyck, a really great, great painter, you can probably see what I'm driving at. Manet has intensity and total um, directness in the way that he paints, total integrity. But he could also do this. And here we are moving into the modern world of Paris, which is fast moving, 
cheeky, impertinent, and breaking the rules. Um, in a sense, the technique of what becomes Impressionism expresses that, the fast-moving politics. Um, we have trains, we have locomotives, we have bridges. We have all kinds of changes speeding up the whole culture. Industry is growing, and somehow that's reflected in the fast, impertinent brushstrokes that come to be described as Impressionism. When Manet is now entering the modern world of Paris, he gives us the flaneur of the boulevard here, who never takes off his top hat, even indoors. He has the essential limp wrist of the flaneur, and he's always clocking the rest of the room. Behind him, you have a woman with attitude who is a waitress, but nevertheless drinking in the very bar she serves in. There's nothing, there's no servitude about her. And then on this side, on the right-hand side, this girl reading a journal. Well, you probably don't think that's particularly interesting, but when you realize she's wearing a hat and gloves, that means she's outside, she's reading. You don't read if you're with other people, you read if you're alone. She's outside in a public place and she's reading and it's cold. And she's not looking at the journal, she's looking above the journal. Can you see that? In other words, she's on the pool in the Tuileries Gardens. <laughs> I mean, I hope that by the time you finish this very crash course that we're doing over five days, you'll be so good at sleuthing around and interpreting paintings and looking just not at the superficial thing, but what the signals tell you. Point was, she could read, she was educated, and when education came in for women, it caused an uproar with certain for crumb people like Degas, uh, ranting and raving at every dinner party about how shocking. Well, I mean, if they can read a journal, the next thing is they might want the vote. That's going to be terribly bad for the world, and who knows? Of course, they'll never end up as prime minister or anything, but nevertheless, it's still worrying. So the fast brushwork, the light, um, the, in the light of the, of, the, of, the demi, of the bar, the light outside in the Tuileries Gardens, everything done at speed on small canvases with hog bristle brushes which were cheap and scratchy. And we're no longer in the world of the sable brush and the fluid glazes that we had in Caravaggio's work and in Leonardo. And of course, we're miles away from the tempera of Botticelli. Um, so he is now the painter of modern life. One of the first 19th century artists, in fact, to approach modern life subjects, which were rife with controversy, as we're going to, dis as we're going to discover. He was really a pivotal figure in this transition from realism to impressionism. Now, when I think of realism, we're probably thinking of Gustave Courbet, who was also, a, you know, he was a real hill raiser. Um, but he f painted that fantastic painting, The Origin of the World, which I'm not going to show you or discuss with you, seeing I'm in Cape Town. No, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But it is quite shocking. And um, so he, he was the first person who really introduces realism, warts and all. And with Manet, he is a kind of pivotal figure between that brutal realism of Courbet and what we call Impressionism. Um, women with attitude, the fact is that in the 19th century, women become much more powerful in terms of their presence in the visual arts. In England, that's easy to explain because we had a queen on the throne, Queen Victoria, right? It's really not difficult to understand why women begin to dominate the art of the 19th century in England. But in France, it's the same thing. And when we look at this painting, it's quite clear that the subject of the painting is the barmaid holding the, the beer two or three at a time. And the other thing is the curiously random way the painting has been painted. This is not a painting that's been structured in a studio. It's not a painting that's been planned to have a, a message. It is a painting that's been done so ra rapidly that one of the main characters looks one way out of the painting, the other one looks the other way, 
whereas in most paintings, people look towards the center. Also, the person in the front is a working man. He wears his blue working man's outfit. He's got his little working cap on. He's smoking a pipe rather than a cigar. And the man in front of him has a gray top hat and is more, let's say, of the gentry with a woman who has a hat and gloves. I think you can see here at the back. Can you see the hat there? And, and probably uh, drinking wine as opposed to beer. And there's an entertainer up on the stage who is in the limelight, because limelights were used to light the stage. But this woman with the hair raised up and attitude, um, you can see that social equalizing is beginning to happen. I particularly love this early Manet. And I did want to show you just a few things that you might not have seen before we go to the Dogenet Soleil. He paints a gypsy. Look at her attitude. The absolutely devil may care, cigarette hanging out of the corner of her mouth, not even making eye contact with the painter like most of his setters did. And in the background, a horse, a gray horse or white, which was usually a signal of romance or even sexuality. During the great period of romanticism through the 19th century, galloping white horses just galloped all over Europe because they are the symbol of romanticism, of this sexual power and so on. White horses, think of Delacroix. Anyway, here she is, gypsy, pitch black hair, black eyes, with an absolute disregard for uh, anything about her own style. It's a marvelous painting, I think. And we can compare her then with a Parisian who is were inside, because a gypsy is obviously an outsider. This girl is a Parisian. And it's called La Prune. It's in the National Gallery in Washington. Now, smoking in public had long been thought of as reserved for men. And when it was done by women, it was associated with promiscuity. Even in Japan, during the Edo period, prostitutes would approach their clients under the guise of offering a smoke or asking for a light. And that's exactly what this girl is doing. Now, you can tell me again where she is. She's not at home because she's wearing a hat. She's sitting on a marble table, which is typical of a French bistro or French cafe. And she's got a drink called La Prune, which had alcohol in it. It was, a, it was a plum soaked in alcohol. And she's got a cigarette, but she's not smoking it because it's not a light. So she's basically looking at the door, who's coming in, who she could kind of be on the pool to get to light a cigarette. Are you getting the sense that Paris is alive with these girls who are fundamentally quite dangerous, who are literally everywhere? Um, Manet is nothing if not totally able to cope with the situation. Now, just a bit of background. He had six years of formal training in the studio of Thomas Couture. And um, <clears throat> from the age of 18 to 24, so this is quite unlike the other people in the Impressionist group, none of whom had formal training except Georges Seurat, who was in the Beaux-Arts. That's why his drawings are so amazing. At 24, he traveled widely around Germany, Austria, and Italy to study the old masters. His family could afford to send him. <clears throat> and that was very important, but it was in the Louvre back home where he found the answers in particularly Spanish art, Velazquez and Goya, and in Titian. But he was also at the same time influenced by the rough and ready, shocking sometimes, realism of Courbet. So Manet really had no wish to be linked with the Impressionists, although he knew them all. He was socially from a different class, and he always had his eye on the salon. He wanted to exhibit at the Salon. That's where he was headed. As you know, the impressions were all rejected wholesale pretty much every year. Um, he was 31 then when he scandalized the art world with the Dogenet Soleil and Olympia in one tremendous year. And then he died uh, when he was just 51 on the 30th of April. Now, there is one of the Spanish paintings, that, the kind of thing that would have influenced him. A beautiful, poised figure with very strong light, but also 
with a great deal of black. Now we know that the Impressionists set themselves up with lots of rules. And one rule was that you shouldn't use black. You could use a mixture of blue and brown, uh, ultramarine and um, burnt umber, but not black. But this black is the thing that really marks out Manet's paintings from the others. And when we look at that portrait and go to probably Manet's most famous portrait, which is this portrait of um, Bert Morisot, you can see how tremendously the black works in his favor. I love Bert Morisot. I even like her opalescent, delicate domestic scenes. Because she was a lady of good breeding, she couldn't go and paint outdoors like the others, even though she was part of the group. She painted quiet interiors, garden scenes. He thinks me not too unattractive and wants to take me back as his model. Out of sheer boredom, I think I'll end by proposing this my very self. And they actually had quite an interesting friendship. He painted very many portraits of Bert Morisot. And the look in her eye, the alertness, tells us that they were very, very close. The portrait stopped sadly when she married his brother, Edmund. Well, here she is, and you can see in the photograph by Felix Nader how incredibly attractive she was. And you see her wearing a Charles Worth dress. Charles Worth was the big name in Paris. You might like to know that he was English, and he was trained in London upholstering sofas and windows at Swan and Edgar's. So he went from doing sofas and windows with swags and tags, tassels to upholstering women in Paris. <laughs> so that's Bert. And again, you can see the, stri the strength of the painting. But the influence of Titian was also quite great. Um, this painting by, um, by Manet of a woman with a jug gives you some very characteristic cliched shapes of Titian. One is the head forward and slightly to the side, with the light coming on one side. The green, which is very typical of, the, of Titian's paintings, is green. And the, the, the twisted wrist, the bent wrist, all of this. Um, originally, of course, coming from Raphael, who is a, is a great specialist in the, in the grace of the movement of figures. And Raphael gets it from Perugino. So you can track it back like that. Um, but now let's come to our painting for today. We're going to do this Dogenet sur le. It's a very large canvas which tells us it was destined for the salon. And it was originally entitled The Bath. And we see a scene in a public park in Paris, in Bois de Boulogne or somewhere, two fully dressed young students, probably from the Latin Quarter. You do know why it's called the Latin Quarter? Because they spoke Latin century for centuries. You were the educated people, they spoke Latin. Um, so here are two young, young poets sitting in the park with two girlfriends, one of whom is in the river wearing a little white chemise, very flimsy, um, lifting up a jug of water. And the one in the foreground has simply thrown off all her clothes in a pile and looks at us. Well, this composition was absolutely <laughs> shocking at the time. But it wasn't only shocking for the subject matter that you have a girl who's thrown off her clothes in a public place in the presence of dressed men, but it was the technique which is considered shoddy and an insult, a slap in the face to the great masters of the high renaissance. How could he present something like that? Now, just as you will be wondering, there are two versions, and the other version is this one. I couldn't get a better resolution. This is the one that we have in London. It's in the Cordo collection, and it's the one that I'm normally working from. So it's good for me, in fact, to be working from the, uh, the, the Musée d'Orsay version. And this was the first version, bought by Samuel Courtauld, a Huguenot, of just Huguenot descent, in, in the 20s, when these arts were very, very cheap. So for 200 years, the salon, where Manet was heading, had dominated the taste and the market in Paris. The salon, here we are in 1767, in the 18th century, almost 100 years before the Dejeuner, shows paintings piled high in every corner. Would you like some water? I've got a spare glass and some water. No, seriously, what a good idea. 
you could just hand that back. Who's coughing? Just give it, because it's terrible to have that irritation. For I've got some as well. Who was coughing up there? Give, there we are. Give, just, oh, it's still on there. Right, okay. Did you, did you get it? Hmm? Have you got water? Oh, good, that's fine then. Good. Don't go. Don't go. Please, then. that would be... No, no, come down here. Please, uh, I didn't mean that at all. I was only worried about the cough. Cause I have a cough myself most of the time. No, um... Oh, God. Anyway, um... This is a hundred years before the, the painting, and it shows paintings piled high in every single corner of the, um, of the, of the salon, jammed together, a hundred years before the painting we're talking about. Um, so it was the place that you went, you, you went to be seen, you can see you never take your top hat off, and this is in 1890, and here's an amazing sculpture of a tiger holding up a crocodile, obviously superb, you know, and this is where you had to, had to be. Now, the original focus was the display of the work of recent graduates of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which was created by Cardinal Mazarin, the chief minister of France, in 1648. That's really early, 1648. Amazing. And exhibiting at the Salon de Paris was absolutely essential for anybody who wanted to be successful in France. For over 200 years, it was literally a closed shop. Um, if you were exhibited at the Salon, you, it's, it was a sign of royal favor. Now, in this particular year, two-thirds of the 5,000 entrants to the Salon were rejected by an unusually harsh committee in 1863. And there was an uproar. And the Emperor Napoleon III ordered a second Salon des Refusés. But the interesting thing about it, when I got to look at it, the interesting thing about it was that the Emperor's aim was not to sanction rejected art, but to actually allow the public to judge the jurors, to judge the Salon, which I think showed a really remarkable modernity, don't you think? But at the Salon des Refusés, the absolute star of the show was the Dejeuner Soulève. And people were simply shocked. <laughs> Mon Dieu, sacre bleu. I mean, God, look at it. Naked women everywhere and with young men. You know, it really was terribly shocking. And we must remember that the assumption was that the art viewing public was male. You know, basically, all the professors were male. It's a male world, and the, the art viewing public was male. So that makes it even more shocking. Um, and people went in there in their thousands. I think on the very first day, I don't know how I got that, there was something like, there were thousands. Did I, did I have the statistic there? Yeah, M huge numbers of people, people, people went on the first day. Um, now, one critic really, of course, it's fun. I'm not a critic. But I could be a very good critic, because you have to have quite a lot of bitch. And the art critic, this art critic wrote this. He wrote, two daubers attired in velvet chat. He thinks they're young art students, right? They chat about the aesthetics with a woman dressed only in her virtue. Its garish coloring pierces the eye like a steel saw. His figures seem to have been cut out with a punch and have a hardness that's capable of no soothing compromise. It has all the unpalatability of green fruit that will never ripen. And that was just the beginning. Now, at the very same salon, I hope I'm not going too fast, uh, at the very same salon, we have this painting by Alexandre Carbonell, and it's the birth of Venus, and it's painted the same year. So this gives us a marvelous chance to compare orthodoxy with unorthodoxy, if you like. This painting was absolutely wonderful. Couldn't have been more beautiful. It was actually bought by Empress, by Empress Eugenie for her husband, Napoleon III. A darling, I think you'll love it. Venus, you know, floating on the sea with incredible amounts of very erotic hair. 
and the, the viewpoint is quite low, right? So we have a sort of dolphin's eye view of this figure. <laughs> and we, we sort of have a very good look at the main body of this woman. Um, and she's peeping under her eyes in a deeply seductive and inviting way. But it's fine, because she's not Parisian, it's not Paris, it's not 1863, she's a Greek goddess and it's all okay. And this was where, and the best, most important thing was that um, Alexandre Carbonell has what I like to call the perfect diction of the salon painter, which means the smooth finish, the silken world of Michelangelo, he could do it. Like, like William Beaujeroux and, and, and Jerome and all the others. So, um, so that painting, now uh, Carbonell, where are we? Um, you could clothe your naked figure in mythology all presented as allegory, and with no clothes at all, and that was fine. But Manet didn't do either. That was where the problem was. Clearly, Manet's nude or naked woman is no goddess, but a modern woman, probably even a prostitute. She not only dares to appear naked with men, but brazenly stares at us, making us accomplices in this amoral picture. We are voyeurs. It's a bit like getting the wrong page on the internet. It's deeply, <laughs> deeply upsetting. And here we are in, with probably with our, you know, maybe if not with our wife, then our companion perhaps, with our top hats and our gloves, we're discussing artwork, and all of a sudden we've got this to deal with. Another woman, scantily clad, only in her chemise, washes herself in a stream. And she's not Bathsheba or Susanna. Like Olympia, this painting brought the issue of syphilis and the huge numbers of prostitutes in Paris to the fore and made it a subject of public debate. And it was this that caused the real outrage. But now let's just look at the painting and the structure and the background. First of all, the influence on Manet of the open air painters from the Barbizon School. The Barbizon School was at Fontainebleau and you could get there by train. So it was the new locomotives that enabled people to go out into the country. Um, this is Theodore Rousseau. Theodore Rousseau invented a folding easel and he invented paint with, in tubes, which meant you could put your easel and your paint and you could walk out and you could paint the forest in real natural daylight. That was an enormous step forward from somebody like Turner, who had to mix his paints in his studio, just do little watercolors, reconstruct the painting back in the studio. That's what everybody had always done. Painting outside, it wasn't the Impressionists who invented plein air, it was the Barbizon paint. When you look at that, very nice. The composition is quite um, classical in the small c, classical, that the, uh, you know, the, the, this line here is sort of two thirds from the top. You've got a strong horizontals, you've got strong verticals, light gathering in the center, you've got reflections, it ticks all those boxes. But I thought we could imagine that Dergenet in this painting and I think it goes rather well. Don't you think so? I mean, I think it pretty much gives us um, a kind of setting for this painting of Manet. And it's a, comp it's a triangular composition, which again is very balanced, very, very, I say, when I say classical, I'm not saying, I'm saying classical with a small C, you do understand, don't you? Not Greek, so it's an equilateral triangle um, framed by trees that have got the same, the same scale, pretty much. And it's framed, and it's like a theater, it's like a stage, and it's very balanced, and that is the composition. Nothing to be shocked about there. But was it absolutely certainly painted out of doors? Was it really out of doors, or was it staged indoors? Now, there's a bit of a clue that Manet overlooked, and that is, if you look at the writer, the artist, the poet here. If you look at this figure here, he's, I mean, he's super dressed up. He's got a cane and gloves and even a hat. But it's the hat that's the problem, because that particular hat was a smoking cap or a thinking cap or a lounging cap, and it was only worn indoors. It was worn to prevent smoke getting in your hair. So it tells us that the whole staging of this was actually done inside in studio. The male figure on the right, then, who were these people? Well, they were all real people. On the right was one of Manet's brothers, 
um, perhaps Eugene or Gustave Manet, or maybe whoever had time to sit, perhaps. And the other man is his brother-in-law, um, Fer Fernand Lienhoff, because Manet married Suzanne Lenhoff, who was his father's mistress for many years. Oh no, it was uh, for many years. I mean, he's about 18. She came into the house to teach him the piano as a young, as a teenager, and things went on from there. And it was only after his father died that he was able to make the relationship public. And there was a child who was always known as her brother, it was probably actually Manet's son. Now, who was the one in the middle? Well, wait, we're going to get to her in a minute. In the background, we have somebody who was probably Alexandrine Zola the wife of Emil Zola, and was supposed to be in the background there. Of course, Zola was a great friend and supporter of Manet. Now, why are the women and the men not communicating? The naked woman is only communicating with us. She is the link. Now, you know that artists have many ways of pulling you into a painting. You could have, as we saw yesterday, an arm coming out to reach you, as you were the Caravaggio. You can have an open window. You can have a path leading to the back of the painting. You can have a beautiful river of light on the sea, um, like a reflection of a tree or something. So many ways, but the best way of all is human contact, and that's eye contact. So she is drawing us into the painting. Nobody is looking. These two men are talking to each other now. You look at the painting, it, was, it caused outrage and it was rejected. And it was rejected primarily because the jury were full of very uneducated men. Remember, we'd had the revolution. During the French Revolution, I think the French killed off most of their educated aristocracy. And we were left, no, seriously, they simply didn't understand what Manet was doing. I'm going to try and put that right today. And I hope that you'll go with me, but if you don't, well, too bad. Um, let's say, first of all, composition. There's no difficulty in finding out. There's no argument. The composition was drawn from a mythological scene, which was actually a composition by Raphael, but the engraving was made by Marc Antonio Raimondi. And you can see, when you look at it, the lower right side, three figures seated down here. And it was that part of this engraving that gave Manet the idea for his composition. Because you can see this figure looks at us and has one leg between the legs of this figure, and that is what he, what he used. So you can see it together. So that's not in doubt. It does tell us that he was looking at a classical, I mean, that as a Renaissance um, prototype when he made the painting, when he composed the figures. But complacent and complicit. She's completely relaxed about the fact that she hasn't got a stitch on, and she even knows we're looking at her, because she's looking at us. It's not like uh, in the proper classical nude, as in Giorgione or Titian, the figures recline, but they graciously turn their heads away so they don't know you're looking at them, you see what I mean? Follow. Even Rock B. Venus by Velazquez, we see her. She, she peeps into a mirror so she knows we're admiring her but there's no question of looking at us. So um, the thing, the, now the, here is Olympia, also painted in the very same year. And you can probably see, if you're on your toes, it's the same woman. Can you see that? So this is Victorine, and she comes into our story right now. Victorine Muron was a very tiny little woman. And he saw her walking through Montmartre one day, swinging a large guitar. She had this lovely red hair, and she was delicate and tiny. And she taught the guitar, and she taught the violin. That's why I played the guitar when you were coming in. Um, she was one of his great models, and he painted her over and over again for very many years. To suggest they had a relationship is probably false, because she lived to, into her 80s, and he died very young, and that just doesn't work because, well, I, I don't want to go into it, but you can probably work it out. Um, and this lovely portrait of her with the gray parrot as well. So Victorine um, is a beautiful, intelligent girl who has been modeling from the age of 16, first of all, in the studio of Thomas Couture, who was one of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts professors. 
They called her La Crevette, the shrimp, because she was tiny and very delicate. And this is a, the only painting survived of hers is this one from Palm Sunday. It's probably a self-portrait. Um, interesting thing was that Victorine had works accepted by the salon when Manet was being refused. So that was, that was interesting. She saw herself as a painter. She belonged to the associations and everything else. Now, we just have a quick look at Olympia because here is Victorine posing as Olympia. The same thing applies. She's looking at us shamelessly. She knows we're there, we know she's there, she knows she's naked, and it goes on like that. And what's more, she's not even, she's not, he hasn't even got a beautiful body, she doesn't tick the boxes, it's a, a short legs, square little torso, and she was attacked incredibly by the critics. She'd been offered a bunch of flowers by her maid, um, who contrasts with the purity of the, of the maid, the white clothes of the maid, the purity of the flowers, uh, in contrast to Victorine with her red um, hibiscus, the red cushions, and of course, she's not a nude. I need to quickly try and explain. There's a bit of a difference between a nude, which is fine, of course, because it's a work of art, and you look at a nude as if it's a landscape, right? There's nice curves and shapes and proportions and you're quite cool about it. She's a woman who took her clothes off, but she didn't take them all off. She's got bracelets, sandals, something around her neck. She quite clearly is a naked woman who took her clothes off. That's a different deal from a nude. And one of the reasons why she was so, um, to cause so much scandal. But Olympia there in 1863. Um, the influence that's behind all of this is our friend Charles Baudelaire. Where are my poets? There they are, somewhere in the middle. Where's Julia? Is she not here? Oh, she is, okay, oh good, okay. Well, Baudelaire was a massive influence. Um, he, Edward Manet was really the first person to take on Baudelaire's uh, uh, you know, demand that people should become painters of modern life. That's what he wanted. Baudelaire himself, well, he wrote about sex, satism, satanism, vampirism, and decay. Wrote about bodies decaying. He wore black, and he dyed his hair green. And he'd been fine. He'd be absolutely fine in Hoxton, wouldn't he? One of those hipster par parts of London. He fell out with his family. He went bankrupt. <coughs> he had lots of sexual experiments, which left him with syphilis. He became a drug addict. And his mistress, Jean Duval, was half Haitian and half black African and was probably illiterate. And he called her, her Venus, his Venus Noir. So all of this was, was, was Baudelaire. And he had a really big influence on the culture of the time. At the same time, photography was going on. And um, people who were producing quite racy studio photos that were available everywhere, something like that. Before we get to that, here is Laura, painted by Manet, very sweet, very gentle woman, very, very loving and beautiful, and, and pure and innocent, and entirely different from the figure in the, uh, from the reclining figure in Olympia. So I think it's quite interesting. And uh, I, uh, here are some of the photographs that were available at the time. And so there were very many, in fact, these were old photographs by the time he made the painting. There were many of these sorts of things around. So painting really shouldn't have been so shocking. Um, suddenly, in an increasingly industrialized material, wait a minute, something I wanted to show you. What's happened to that? Oh, yes, I wanted to tell you that recently the painting, famous painting, Olympia, which is in the Musée d'Orsay, was renamed Laura. Well, you know, the Musée d'Orphée is becoming, it's very woke, obviously. It's the right on brand. Do you, do you know what woke is? Yes. yes. So it's lovely. It's, it's, a, it's a mistranslation of a past tense of awake. Um, yes, it means being very aware, so of cultural things. So there she is. And um, we go on back to the painting. In an increasingly industrialized material world, it was not only the things that had become more available and exchangeable, but also the markers of social rank and exchangeable, sorry, yes, um, and social class. Rank and class were now becoming interchangeable. 
Manet took this breaking down of traditional social orders as one of his big themes. Um, Zola comes to Manet's defense. He says, there are many paintings in the Louvre where you have fully dressed men and naked women, so what's the problem? It's art. And he mentions at least 50. Well, I'm not going to bore you with 50. By the way, do you see in the background he's got the Olympiac there? Now, um, this one, for example, by Delacroix, where you have two clothed figures and one very luxurious naked odalisque. Or this painting, even earlier, by Giorgione, fully dressed man looking at a woman, naked woman. So that couldn't have been the problem. Even more important is this painting by Giorgione, finished by Titian, called the Concert Champetre, which is in the Louvre. And this is the one we're now going to look at, because in my view, this is the painting that really directed the Dergenet Soulève. In this painting, we see two young men. One is a courtier playing a lute, and one is a young shepherd, and they are talking. We then have two women, both of them pretty much naked. This woman here is playing the flute, sitting in front of them playing the flute, and this one with a very classical um, drape is lifting water out of a lovely trough of water. She has a typical contraposto um, serpentine composition. Well, let's look at what they mean. The woman that's sitting down with the flute alludes very clearly to sexuality and sexual role of women. What I'm showing you here is the side of something called the Ludovisi throne, which is, yeah, Greek, um, and it shows a hetaira, or a Greek courtesan, playing the double aulis. And you can see perhaps another example here. This is a very nice red figure vase showing a courtesan playing the double aulis while a young man listens in ecstasy, um, drinking his wine from his calyx. So the flute has always been associated with this role of women. Um, when we go to the other painting, we know that the color white is associated with purity and that water is associated with purity and purification. She's bending down with the, a very, very much a Venetian attitude, wa taking water and wearing white, which is what we have if we look in the back of the painting by Manet. Are you beginning to see these figures are polarized, yeah? They're polarized, and they're polarized for a good reason. The woman at the back is stooping and bending. Now that's an attitude of humility. When somebody bends towards the earth, the word for earth in Latin is humus, humility when you bend towards the earth. She's wearing white and she's standing in water. No eye contact, downcast eyes, modesty. The two men are lost in thought. They're talking deeply to each other. They don't even seem to know that there's a woman sitting right in front of them with a flute. They simply don't see her. They are lost in a deep conversation, and I wonder what they're talking about. Well, they're talking about the women, but the women aren't there at all. The women are just figments of their imagination there to tell us, the viewer, what the conversation is about. We can see these young men are sitting on a nice grassy hill, lost in a conversation and playing a lute. Uh, they're talking about love. What else do boys talk about? But they're talking about the two kinds of women, the, 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 the sensual woman, the profane woman, and the pure woman. It's love, sacred, and profane. That's what they're discussing. It's platonic. It goes right back to that. So these figures, if they stood up, would be much, much taller. Can you see how big they are? They are on a different scale from the two men in the center of the painting. This, I think, then, is the same theme in this painting. The point I'm making is the jurors had no concept of what Manet was really doing. He was rerunning or rechanneling this idea that the painting can show you far more than what the people in the painting actually see. I think in this painting, the two poets could be discussing um, sacred and profane love, and the two girls could be there, again, to show us what the conversation is. Um, now, going a little bit more in the painting, you have the basket that's tipped up and the fruit is pouring out of it. And that actually 
is rather a subtle allusion to a cliche in Renaissance art, which look at right now. So in Renaissance art, if you showed an amphora or vase tipped up, you were alluding to lost virginity, to purity spilt. An amphora or vase is also a symbol of the womb, of the woman, of the female, with a lid usually, so tipped up. And you can see that Manet is referencing Titian's great um, Bacchus and Ariadne. Here is Ariadne, and there is her vase tipped up. And exactly the opposite applies to purity. So if we look at this one, a detail by, Ant by Ante van Dyck, it's Adoration of the Shepherds, you see the vase upright in the presence of the Virgin Mary. You all okay with that? Am I going too fast? Are you sure? Okay. I, I had a bit of... It, uh, it didn't start quite well. Um, right, so we go back to it. Is it an allegory of love, sacred and profane, or is it a thoroughly modern Parisian scene? Well, obviously, most of the people who went to the academy, uh, went to the Salon des Refusés, thought that it was a perfectly modern Parisian scene. And they didn't realize that what Manet was probably doing was trying to reference um, a traditional, much more complicated idea. Now, right at the top, there's a tiny little bullfinch flying up there, which people don't normally see. And scholars believe that he flutters along uninvited into the painting to, to sort of open the eyes of the viewer to what's going on. And right down in the bottom left, there is um, a little frog. And he could be there because the word frog was a sort of insulting nickname for prostitutes in Paris. They were called frogs. There were quite a lot of other nicknames as well, cocottes, lorettes, whatever. So it's possible that the frog is there to sort of allude to the behavior of the girl. Now, there they are. You see, you would never see them unless you actually knew they were there. So looking at the painting now, we're drawn into the painting by the eyes of the girl. Remember, man is a man. Everybody he painted looked at him, particularly when they were all girls. Um, you see the composition, which is a triangle, takes you to the back, and you see this girl picking up a jug of water. I'm always reminded of the end of that great Fellini film. I forget which one, where the girl goes out into the scene, walks, and walks straight towards the camera holding a glass of cold water. Do you know which Fellini one? You've probably seen it much more recently than I. Anyway, that, that, is, that is Fellini at the end of one of his most outrageous films. Um, it was bought finally by this man who was an opera singer, and his name was Jean-Baptiste Fauré, Fauré, and he bought it for 2,600 francs. He had it for quite a long time. And I'm not sure if this paint, oh, it was painted by Manet, I see, very good. It was slightly from a lower viewpoint, because he'd always be on a stage, wouldn't he, as an opera singer? Um, <clears throat> well, Manet himself claimed that the painting was worth 25,000 francs. And I, Manet probably had rather a high regard for his, the monetary worth of his paintings, because I just got one example to give you. He sold this little painting, this one, this is a little bunch of asparagus. He sold this little painting to Charles Effrussi, Count Effrussi, who comes into the famous book, The Hair with Amber Eyes, which I'm sure everybody's had a look at. Um, he was mad about the Impressionists. He bought lots of artwork. And Manet sold this painting to him. Afterwards, having a twinge of scruples that he'd probably asked too much and you know he'd sort of, and so what he did was he painted another stick of asparagus and sent it on for free. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Manet was a man who knew, you know, he did have, but he was quite right in valuing his work very highly. Now, some of his followers and precedents, um, a couple of years later, Monet decides, of course, everybody reveres Manet. He is the leader of the avant-garde. He's the big man. They've all been sharing a house down at Argenté. Um, they've all been painting on the river together and everything else. So Monet does the same thing. He does a déjeuner sur l'herbe of his own. But it's quite different. 
It's much more about the sun dabbling through the green leaf. And um, the girl in the background lifts her arm because she's the same girl. So you can't, you know, it's Kami, it's Kami Monet modeling for all the same figures. The tall man in the background is very sadly Frederick Basile, who died in the Franco-Prussian War. And it took his father 10 days to find the body. In those days, they didn't do dog tags and records. You died, you died, end of story, you know. But anyway, the light pouring down on the picnic, dappling, this is Monet, and it's, it's a beautiful dress that Kami's wearing, but entirely different in message and really in meaning, completely different. Um, I've got the feeling that the picnic probably descended originally from Anton Watteau's paintings, which very often involved picnics at Versailles, wonderful distant sort of views, um, of lakes and so on. But here's a very genteel picnic carrying on. The girl is drinking wine from glass. Um, again, it's got a very simple composition of a triangle, but it doesn't do anything like what Manet's painting did. But it does show you that there was something rather fun in getting out of your house and away from the routine of your life and taking a picnic out into the, into the land. It's a very modern sort of thing to do. Um, this one was a little bit interesting in the fact that the gamekeeper and his wife, or the servant, somebody, one of the farm estate workers, was a, was, came to the picnic, probably carried everything, but didn't actually join the family. Do you see that? So I, I just thought that was interesting uh, for that reason alone. But the very idea that somehow when you're picnicking, it's a modern thing. When you think of the tremendous formality of meals, in the earlier centuries. It does suggest that the late 19th century was kind of much more modern. This painting is quite clearly um, a sort of a flight from modernism. The world is industrializing. There are locomotives, bridges with nuts and bolts, um, factories pouring smoke out everywhere, children going into mines, the Industrial Revolution firing ahead. At the same time, a distinct desire to escape from modernism which you get in English art of the late 19th century, people like Waterhouse, people like that, painting these quasi-medieval paintings uh, or even quasi-Greek paintings to, to sort of um, escape. So this is very much that kind of painting. But the most important follower is Picasso, which is wonderful. It leads us straight into tomorrow when we're going to, do, we're going to deal with Picasso. Uh, he made about 27 paintings and maybe 140 drawings and three lino cuts um, and lots of models, all based on the Dejeuner Celebre. Yeah, very interesting, and they're, this, they're very flat. I mean, the original painting has got depth perspective. With Picasso, everything is flattened out, and he's uh, limited the palette just to green, white, and black, and the figures are very much his own. So in 1961, now Picasso is quite an obsessive person. 